As you all know, I love phones to have a unique selling point, a USP. And boy, does the Yota Phone 2 have a USP at a price. At first glance, it's a premium looking touchscreen slab, all plastic, but very solid indeed. A five inch AMOLED 1080p screen with Android KitKat and virtual controls. This is all sounding very Nexus like. In fact, the specs are almost identical to a 32 gig Nexus 5 across the board with software to match and that this runs effectively stock Android with just a few extra applications of which more later. We're talking the Google Experience launcher, vanilla Android and Google apps so far so good. The USP is on the back, which in this case is covered by this promotional display mock-up sticker, which I can't seem to get off. Oh, hang on. It's built into the plastic and it's a, it's a live touchscreen. Oh, wow. This is e-ink, e-paper, as seen in a zillion Amazon Kindles, though not backlit. And it's jolly impressive in the context of what e-paper can do. Displaying content, just as on the Kindle, consumes no power at all until a refresh or a change is needed. Well, OK, the Android OS is keeping the touchscreen active, but the power usage is dramatically lower, say 10 times than when using applications on the front AMOLED screen. And you can use any application on the back, thanks to the Yota applications, including this full Feedly and RSS client. And all other mainstream apps come in via the Yota mirror system. Uh, here's Gmail, for example and even YouTube. It's pretty amazing, really. I wonder if Amazon could get close to this on its Kindles. Nope, they don't have a Snapdragon 800 powering at all. Also highlighted is this ebook reader, OPDS compatible. That's our project Gutenberg, etc., etc. So it should be easy enough to add some reading material for long train journeys. Most striking of all, though, is that for a confirmed fan of glance screens on my Nokias, the Yota Phone 2 offers the ultimate glance display with time, date, weather, and whatever you want, really, all passively updated just once a minute, but again using next to no power. And if you're worried about the back activating in a pocket, then look no further. It has its own built-in lock screen, though you do lose the glanceability in this mode. So how is this for a selling point? <laughs> it's true that it's a bit of a gimmick, but what a gimmick. If you travel a lot and if battery worries dominate your day, then maybe some Android e-ink action could be just what you need. Away from the back display, it's a fast and capable KitKat machine with 2 gig of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage, though like that Nexus 5, not expandable, sadly. Nor can you replace the sealed 2500 milliampere battery, though at least there's an obvious reason for this. Added to the Yota software already mentioned are some e-paper compatible games, including Sudoku, chess here, and checkers, but those apart, it's down to you what you add Nexus style. A Yota energy function here on the quick settings panel turns out to be a typical 2015 energy saving mode for emergencies, cutting off most sync and connectivity functions and turning the brightness right down, etc. It's very configurable too. And add this to the e-ink screen and you could at a pinch start the day with 10% battery left after a charging mishap overnight and still struggle through to the end of the day, I think. Wow. <laughs> the 8 megapixel camera is, well, I've no idea since the review devices had failed. Bizarre. I'm sure it's a one-off fault. I'm sure retail units will be absolutely fine. It's nothing special, I'm sure. Uh, there's a single AV flash, but you do get the usual 1080p video recording as well. Media playback is good, though the single speaker is tiny, fairly quiet, and tucked away on the bottom face with predictably limited results. This is maximum volume. It's not great by 2015 standards. One final thing to note is that the nano SIM tray is hidden, and I mean really hidden. It's behind the flipping volume key. Seriously, it's a clever idea that I hope A proves robust and B catches on. It reduces the number of access points in an otherwise solid phone chassis like this one. With vanilla Android, a solid build, very decent specs, and a jaw-dropping USP here. The Yota Phone 2 has a lot going for it, but there is a catch. And in this case, it's the price. Presumably because of the specialist nature and limited quantities being made, the price in the UK is around £540, including VAT. Given that the aforementioned Nexus 5 and similar LG G2 are £300 or less, you're paying £250 or so for that Android e-paper experience. But if you have to have e-paper and you want possibly hyper battery life, then the new Yota phone is currently unique. Just write it off as a business expense, perhaps. 
And a big thanks to Clove for the review sample, by the way. Even if the Yota Phone 2 doesn't float your boat, then give them a try for your other needs. They're great people. Yes, it's another Pro Porter accessory slot, looking at the stuff they sell, which I like and can recommend. In this case, a rather fabulous little gadget that sits by my bed and charges just about everything. Rather than tie up up to six main sockets with charges that convert mains to five volt USB and thence to all my family's phones, tablets and other gadgets, just use one plug and the multi-port turbocharger here and you've got six USB outputs with a total capacity of nine, repeat nine amps. That's enough for three smartphones and three high-end tablets, iPads and the like, all with their own preferred manufacturer USB leads. Apple's kit in particular doesn't like third-party cables. There's a smart ID system inside with the idea that each connected device is supplied with the most efficient current for its electronics. And I have no idea how this works. It's quite clearly magic. What's also magic is the way it can simplify the rat's nest of mains wiring behind my desk and behind my bed. Now, if they can only add Qi charging to the top as well. <laughs> hmm. You saw earlier a product with a unique selling point at a high price. Here's something whose unique selling point, other than its rarity, is the price. This is the OnePlus One, which I finally got my hands on. You can only buy these via an invite from someone else who has one or via various special offer days on the OnePlus website, of which more later. The immediate value proposition is terrific, with specs that you'd expect to pay up to £500 for at around £270 all in here. 64 gig of internal storage, 3 gig of RAM, a 2.5 gigahertz Snapdragon 801, a 5.5 inch IPS 1080p screen, a 3100 mAh battery, all for less than the year old Nexus 5, Moto X, etc., yet significantly outgunning both. And there has to be a catch, and there are a few caveats which I'll get to shortly, but on the whole what you see is indeed what you get. A fast and functional top spec Android smartphone at a good £200 less than you'd expect to pay. The OnePlus One is all plastic, but it's massively disguised by a heavy and grippy texture over the back and sides. The idea is that you won't have to put this in a case and that you'll be unlikely to drop the naked phone, and I appreciate the design effort. In theory, the back comes off, but there's no obvious way in. I didn't want to force it on this loan device. With the cover off, the battery is exposed, according to iFixit, but not officially user replaceable. Hey, there'll be a YouTube video somewhere showing how to do it, I'm sure, in the same DIY manner as on uh, iPhones and the Nexus 5. The five and a half inch screen itself is large. Yet the device is still manageable thanks to small side bezels. And look, I can wrap my thumb and middle finger around it. The OnePlus One certainly feels like a phone and not like a phablet. It's not the highest quality screen I've ever seen. It's not oleophobic, so it collects fingerprints and doesn't feel as smooth as other top-end phones. Plus, reflectivity outdoors is pretty bad. Screen component quality is something that often suffers in budget devices, and there's a hint of this here. But inside, especially with the screen brightness cracked up, it's easy to get lost in the 1080p detail. The true stereo speakers on the phone's bottom have limited separation, obviously, but worse, they're very average, really. Here's a demo. This is maximum volume. Some rather distorted and harsh and rather unpleasant Pink Floyd there. OK, you may think Pink Floyd are already unpleasant. The 13 megapixel camera on the back is pretty good. Probably the same sensor as used in the likes of the recent HTC mid to top enders with dual LED flash and a next gen Cyanogen camera interface. All shots came out fine except the usual bugbear use cases of night time with no OIS here to allow longer shutter times and indoor people shots where LED simply isn't good enough, insert Steve Zinnan rant for the millionth time. So on a very cold winter's day in the UK, I'm, I'm sheltering in the summer house, cheating here. This is 1080p sample video capture on the OnePlus One. No OIS, so there's probably some shaking going on. Focusing seems to be manual. You tap on what you want to focus on. I pre-focus this on myself, but uh, that's fine. And I hopefully I look crisp. Hopefully I sound crisp too. See what you think. So far, so good then. Slightly compromised hardware, but then the price is relatively low, low, low. 
In terms of software, this is a customized version of Cyanogen ROM, which is built on Android 4.4. You all know that I'm fond of Cyanogen, but it does seem as if the folks there and at OnePlus have had to do some work on all this hardware. I crashed the phone within 60 seconds out of the box. Plus, there were all sorts of quirks, not least London being proclaimed to be GMT plus one. At Greenwich Mean Time, by definition, guys, come on. Happily, two successive incremental updates over the air over the next 24 hours fixed all the instabilities, lag and quirks, and everything is now as nippy as you'd expect. And I'm back on GMT. Cyanogen is, as you know, pretty darn close to stock Android with just some bells and whistles here and there. What's more curious is the use of old school Samsung style menu home and back keys in that order. What were OnePlus thinking here in 2014 stroke 2015? At least virtual controls can be turned on in Cyanogen in settings. These revert to the latest Nexus standards, but you do lose some of this nice big screen. Would I recommend the OnePlus One? Well, yes, only if value for money was paramount. OnePlus's invite-only system for potential buyers is bizarre, clearly meant to limit sales so that the startup company doesn't get overwhelmed. But resources are clearly tight. I do wonder about continued support in the future. Uh, the 64 gigabyte OnePlus One can't currently be matched in the phone market at the price, but I do think the let's be as cheap as possible attitude became a bit too prevalent at the design stage.